I'm Joan Kerr, and this is World Canvas Studio from International Programs. We're coming to you from University Capital Center on the campus of the University of Iowa. And I'd like to begin by thanking our partners, UITV, the University of Iowa, Pentacrest Museums, KRUI-FM, and Information Technology Services. This program is being recorded for statewide television and radio distribution over UITV, Iowa Public Radio, and KRUI-FM. It will also be available, along with all programs in the series, as a free podcast on iTunes. And now let me welcome our special guests. First, we have the Honorable Roy Bennett, Deputy Minister of Agriculture and Treasurer of Zimbabwe's Movement for Democratic Change, known as the MDC, the opposition party headed by Prime Minister Morgan Changarai. It's an honor to have you with us, Mr. Bennett, thanks. Sam, thank you very much. <laughs> and uh, next to him is uh, Leo Echo, or Leombe Echo, uh, University of Iowa Professor of Journalism and Mass Communication in the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences, also co-director of the African Studies Program, a part of international programs here at the university. So thanks, Leo, for being here. Thank you. And uh, last but not least is Farai Marazi, who is a UI doctoral student in anthropology from Zimbabwe. And it's great to have you here, Farai. Thanks. It's a pleasure. Roy Bennett is a farmer and former policeman who was elected to the House of Assembly in 2000 from a largely black district despite intimidation and physical attacks on his family and himself. The MDC won the very tight 2008 election and was recognized internationally as the winner. However, Robert Mugabe and his party, the Zimbabwe African National Union, refused to give up control. After the MDC agreed to share power with Mugabe's party, Prime Minister Morgan Changarai designated Roy Bennett Deputy Minister of Agriculture. He's been imprisoned repeatedly and has decried the human rights violations and appalling conditions prisoners are subjected to under Mugabe's rule. His well-being constantly under threat. He has lived for several years in exile in South Africa and in London. In spite of these challenges, Roy Bennett continues to advocate for democracy and an end to repression in Zimbabwe as he awaits the next round of elections. Very good to have you here, Mr. Bennett. My pleasure, John. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. And uh, I thought that we might begin our hour together by asking you to tell us a little bit about your personal story, your personal evolution from a little kid growing up in a farm in Rhodesia to becoming a member of the opposition party and now a member of uh, the government. Um, thanks very much, John. Firstly, I, I'm not uh, the Deputy Minister of Agriculture. I am the Deputy Minister of Agriculture designate, um, and Mugabe refused to swear me in. Instead, I was arrested and, and put in prison. Um, I, I, my grandfather came to Zimbabwe in, in 1892. My father was born in Zimbabwe in uh, 1911. I was born in Zimbabwe in 1957. My son was born there in 1985. I grew up in a very rural background. Um, the only little white kid amongst all the black children on my father's farm. I grew up herding cattle. I grew up barefoot, I grew up with a catapult, and in a very carefree and, and uh, very rural uh, uh, environment. On leaving school, there was uh, compulsory conscription during those times, and um, I went into the British South African Police, where I did three years, uh, in order that I could then leave and go into college without being called up from continuing conscription and uh, call up. I left in 1978, went into Agricultural College, and graduated from Agricultural College in 1980, just at the um, uh, start of, of our independence. Um, I embraced the independence in our country. We all, everybody, had huge hope and uh, joy at moving forward into freedom and democracy, the end of white minority rule, all of us coming together as one and a country to build and move forward. It was in the total in start of my career, having just part out of, out of college, I was a farm assistant uh, uh, for three years. I then uh, leased a farm and eventually bought a farm and ended up by 1986 owning five farms in the north of the country in Karoi, which I sold in 1993. I was no longer a farmer. I was running around chasing managers and not a very pleasant existence. I decided to go back and get the sun on my back and 
my feet in the ground and I purchased a farm in the southeast of country in 1993 from a multinational company called the Wattle Company. Um, this farm was purchased then with a government certificate of no present interest and before I purchased the farm I followed our traditional values which I'd grown up with and were very dear to me. I approached the farm is divided by the Junguni River and to the sun where the sun rises from Mabazua to where the sun sets, Kumadokiro, uh, there was a river splitting the two called the Junguni. One side was Chief Chukukwa, the other side was Mambungurima. And I followed the traditional values and you don't ever approach a chief in your own capacity. You send somebody, I send a Numa to say that um, I had an interest in purchasing that farm, but before I would go ahead with the purchase, I needed their blessing and for them to allocate me that land uh, before I purchased it. So the due ceremonies were done, it took about six months and finally the answer came back that I was now an accepted son in the area and I then went ahead and purchased Charlesworth Estate, which was a coffee estate. Um, I worked very closely with my local community. I grew that estate from 80 hectares of coffee to 310 hectares of coffee. Uh, when I left Karoi and went to Chimani Mani, <clears throat> my workers who had been working for my father came with me um, and we uh, started off in Chimani Mani, about 60, 60 workers and grew it to 350 and then uh, 2,000 a day uh, casual workers. I started coffee projects in the area with the sole aim of economically empowering people through crops that would return an economic value. Um, I worked very, very closely with all all the um, traditional leaders uh, and got myself involved in school projects, got myself involved when my trucks were coming back from the city empty, I would load fertiliser and deliver to points where people could access that fertiliser um, and ended up with a very, very good relationship with my community to such an extent that when we had massive rains and the weeds in my coffee had got the better of us on the farm and the labour that we had, the chief summoned me to send my trucks and I collected 800 people who came and worked for me uh, for free for two days. When I wanted to pay them, they refused to accept payment and they said that it was a gesture to in appreciation for uh, how I'd been working with them. And in our term, it's called Jundera Mambo. Uh, and they had come for two days and given me Jundera Mambo. So on the backdrop of that relationship in 1999, I was approached by the Zonu PF structures and the traditional leaders uh, who asked me to stand for politics. Um, I'm a God-fearing man. I sat with my wife and discussed it because it, we all understand and uh, well, the turmoil of African politics and we prayed about it and um, I decided that I would take up uh, the responsibility that the people had, had brought to me. But the Zonu PF government had absolutely no plans for me getting involved in their politics and refused to accept me as a candidate um, at the primary elections, which resulted in the traditional leaders and the people I traversed the whole constituency and met all the Zonu PF structures right down to the most basic level. Um, and when I was not allowed to stand as a candidate, we had a meeting and decided that possibly I would stand as an independent and it was at that time when the referendum had just occurred and just after the referendum or at the time of the referendum the opposition party, the movement to them, a democratic change was formed and uh, after serious debate people decided that maybe it would be a good idea for us to go to Harare and find out about this party so myself and some of the traditional leaders went through to Harare, met with Morgan Sangira and the leadership of the MDC understood the ideology, understood uh, their constitution, took it back again, and then called a meeting with all, all the people and spent going right into the early hours of the morning discussing it, whereupon they decided that I should stand for the opposition. When uh, this decision was taken, I made it very clear that we all had been through a war. We all knew what Sony PF was about and what they were capable of. And we gave each other a thing called, which is chisungo, which means you make a bond that you won't desert each other. And I said, on that basis, 
I will stand firm as long as you stand behind me. And immediately that my candidature for the opposition was announced, the repression and the um, intimidation started. I was in Arari uh, at a Zimbabwe Congress of Trade Unions meeting, and my wife was alone on the farm with my workers when the opposing candidate mobilised a bunch of Zonu PF youth and militia who came in and descended on my home, rounded up all our workers, brought them into the, the yard by the house and started beating my workers, denouncing me, denouncing Songira and the opposition. My wife was five months pregnant at the time. She stepped in to uh, stop my workers being beaten. It was raining. She was then pushed around. She had a machete pushed at uh, her neck and she lost the child the next day. Uh, they moved into my home, took over my home completely, looted everything that was in there and started rounding up all the structures, all the political structures within the Chimani Mani constituency, bringing them back to my home, which was the base, and proceeded to beat them in my home uh, for supporting opposition politics. On the backdrop of all those violence, uh, this went on for about a month. We then had the elections, and I still won the seat of 11,000 votes to 8,000 votes, and then started a journey up to now of con dear, continued and severe persecution, um, which would take hours to go into and explain. It ended me up getting imprisoned. It ended me up seeing the insides of Zimbabwe prisons. Um, a lot of my workers were killed. It ended up me holding dead people in my hands. A lot of my workers' daughters were raped. Um, a lot of people's homes were burnt in my constituency. A lot of my friends and colleagues that I'd uh, got involved with politics were beaten, raped, had their homes burnt, their property destroyed. A very, very traumatic uh, time, but the people true to our Chisungo stood very, very strong with me, and to this day I try and represent them openly and honestly in the best way I can to try and bring democracy, good governance, and the rule of law back to our country. So that's my background. Well, it's in it's short. Breathtaking. <laughs> it's breathtaking. Um, um, I will, want, I will ask you in a, in a moment to tell us you know, how it is emotionally and psychologically possible for you to sit in a, in a joint government now with uh, the ZANU uh, party. But um, before that, I'd just like to ask you a little bit about the, the fact that you, as you said, you, know, you, you just grew up as an ordinary kid playing on the farm, whatever. You sort of saw a path you hoped for yourself and had no real intention of being in politics until it appeared to be inevitable. Um, for, for many people who don't face all this kind of persecution, somebody deciding to run for local office here in the States perhaps, it's still a big, big question. Should I or should I not run for office? My life becomes public. Who knows what will happen? In your circumstances, it was you know, multiplied a, a million times because of the danger. Um, have you ever reconsidered that decision and just kind of wished you could have faded back into a quiet life? All the time. The more, the more you subjected, and if you look at what ZANU-PF does and how they've tried to destroy any form of opposition within Zimbabwe, it's based on the Marxist-Leninist um, uh, theory that you can intimidate and uh, force people out of politics by destroying their wealth, by threatening them with their lives, by beating them, by imprisoning them, and eventually uh, people will not oppose you. And it's, it's very true to a large extent. Um, many people... Uh, shied away from visible opposition politics and, and as we say in Zimbabwe today and right across the length and breadth of the country, they don't come out openly and show their political affiliation at all. They just keep quiet and, and stay out of the way because of the ramifications of anybody who's seen to be supporting opposition and that is the random beating, destruction of property, killings, raping. So it, it, is, it is the way that, um, that Zonu PF have what they've done to people. And um, when that happens to you, you do consider it. But then, you know, when I look back at my friends and my community and the people that I really got to know well, at all my workers that uh, have suffered terribly, and some of them I don't even know where they are, um, many have died, um, it's worth continue fighting for something that's good. It's worth fighting for people that have believed in me, um, people that haven't seen my colour, people that are not sucked into the racial agenda of Zonu PF or Zonu PF's machinisms, people who see me as a good person, I see them 
in the same vein. I don't see black people. I see them as my community and the people that I, I love and have, have lived with and grown up with. And um, it's on the basis of, of them and that if you know I happen to have a calling or I happen to have the ability to be able to stand up and speak out on their behalf, then that's what I promised to do. I gave my side of the Chisungo, so I'm there uh, to see this thing through. Well then, a last question for me for a while. Um, how is it really that, that uh, you and your colleagues on, in the MDC um, go in, go forward with this uh, partnership, this sort of what is called shared government, governance with the uh, Mugabe administration? How is it possible for these two sides to do what they can to move Zimbabwe forward when you have such severe differences and such grievances? Well, the, therein lies the problem. Nothing is really moving forward. If you look at today, at Zimbabwe today, you have the military and totalitarian rule firmly in charge. Uh, what is uh, uh, a, um, a progressive and positive note is that the MDC is in government, whereas yesteryear Mugabe was saying uh, Tsongirai would never be in government, he would never have anything to do with Tsongirai, he now sits in a cabinet with him. Um, and whilst they still call the shots and offer the violence and repression, the entry of the MDC uh, into government stabilised the macroeconomics. The three reasons we went in was to stabilise the macroeconomics, to address the social situation and to lay the groundwork uh, under a set of guarantees uh, of a free and fair election within a time frame. All that is history. We need to move forward. Uh, there's many outstanding issues in that global political agreement. Zona PF have been totally duplicit in that agreement. They haven't honoured anything uh, of any value in that agreement. We find ourselves nearly three years down the line and not much movement forward. We find uh, uh, Zona PF ministers uh, pushing 51% indigenisation rules to uh, get things for the cronies. The people haven't benefited at all and um, there's no foreign direct investment. Uh, the country's reeling and in, in dire straits, uh, yet we look forward and, and take hope out of the fact that the Southern African demerit community, led by the facilitator Jacob Zuma, have uh, undertaken and underwritten the global political agreement that reforms will take place, and we will have a non-violent free and fair election. And it is on that hope and that basis that we push forward and try in very, very difficult and totally polarised circumstances uh, to keep this thing together in trying to reach a stage where the people of Zimbabwe can vote. That vote is respected. There's a, a change of dynamics and we can move the country forward into good governance, the rule of law and a better life for all. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Leo, let me invite you into the conversation now. Um, Mr. Bennett, it's, very, it's a pleasure for me to meet you and your colleagues here. Um, as somebody who has um, been uh, to Zimbabwe many times in my professional capacity, I, uh, in the 90s, Zimbabwe was a breadbasket. And uh, it's, it's a very beautiful country. It's uh, the landscape, the, 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 the people, the, it's, it's really, really nice. So it, it really, uh, it, it breaks my heart to think that Zimbabwe had the record of hyperinflation in the world where you had trillionaires who could not buy a, a loaf of bread. And so um, um, my question to you as someone who is in the media is first of all, what would you say is um, uh, the vision for the MDC knowing that ultimately Mugabe will have to go? Nature will take its course. Its course. Mugabe is not a young person. What is the vision for uh, of the MDC in terms of number one, human rights, uh, number two, uh, freedom of speech and of the press, which uh, I understand has been severely curtailed in Zimbabwe. Thanks, Leo. In the global political agreement, there were five main issues in that agreement. And those were around reforms that needed to take place against uh, those issues. And those commissions were the Human Rights Commission. They were the Constitutional Commission. They were the Media Commission. Um, and it's on those commissions whereby 
a non-partisan commission comprising of people from all parties and civil society would form a commission that would look at and reform the existing uh, um, repressive uh, uh, rules around each of those uh, uh, areas and then uh, move into an election where that's been addressed. The human rights currently is non-existent. There's, there's no basis of human rights at all. The media, whilst a commission has been put in place and there should have been a freeing up of the airwaves and radio licenses and uh, newspapers uh, uh, being registered and allowed, We've seen two new daily newspapers come on, online, uh, which is a positive plus that that's happened. The daily newspaper that originally, the daily news that was bombed in, in 2000 uh, and, and destroyed has come back online. And there's a new publication called The Newsday, which has the freedom of expression to a degree. Um, and we still find their journalists being harassed. We find their journalists being, um, being intimidated and victimized. Uh, as far as the, the, the airwaves go, there were supposed to have been um, radio licenses issued. We've seen nothing of that happens. We still have a, a only one uh, uh, a radio station that continually pushes uh, Zone PF government propaganda all the time. So there are severe challenges. There are outstanding issues in the global political agreement. There are issues that the Southern African development community agreed that they would underwrite and make sure that those reforms took, pla took take place. So. We are busy talking about those things uh, and rest assured there will be no election uh, until the global political agreement is, is uh, implemented in its, in, its in, in, to in its totalitarian and those commissions and those issues are addressed. Okay, thank you very much. My next question has to do with the problem of race relations in Zimbabwe. You know that ZANU-PF, I understand, uh, has um, transformed what could have been an ex the example of a good multiracial society, a good society that had diversity. I understand uh, uh, that uh, ideal has been destroyed by a, a narrow nationalism or even pan-Africanism, if you like. Can you comment on that? Yes, Leo. Yeah. Very, very, very simply, it is a small minority's view. The people of Zimbabwe don't have a racist bone in their body. They have absolutely none of that uh, 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 racist slant that Zona PF have tried to, to push across. On the Pan-Africanist view, what Zona PF did and how they used it was basically to attack an ethnic cleanse uh, the white population on the backdrop of having ethnic cleansed the Nevelis in the early 80s on the basis of land and colonial imbalances um, uh, and race, racial slants. And the truth of the matter is that uh, all this started in 2000 when Robert Mugabe pushed a constitution forward that he wished to change the constitution of Zimbabwe to give himself life presidency and to allow for Zone PF to be a one-party state. And the people of Zimbabwe, across the length and breadth, formed the National Constitution Alliance. There were uh, uh, trade unions, there was civil society, there was business, there was farmers. Everybody came out and bonded together to fight the change in that constitution. And for the first time in 20 years, Mugabe was defeated in that referendum. He was issued a resounding defeat by the Zimbabwean people and they voted no against the implementation of that constitution. Now, in that vote, the commercial farmers, which happened to be white uh, in the large majority areas, uh, employed a lot of the labor. The labor happened to be unionized. Uh, the union, the Zimbabwe uh, Agricultural General and uh, Plantations Union, was aligned to the Zimbabwe Congress of Trade Unions, who were advocating a no vote in that referendum. And the farmers uh, gave all the logistical support to the workers to register to be able to vote and also supplied them with transport on the voting day. And it came out very clearly in that referendum the role that the agricultural workers and their voting constituency had played in the defeat of Robert Mugabe and Zona PF. Now, 
if you looked at how many agricultural workers there were then, you were looking at about 400,000 agricultural workers. Uh, if you took their families into, into context, you were looking about a million votes coming out of the agricultural sector um, in a total voting population of 2.3 million. So it was an extremely significant voting block that had a, a complete sway vote on the way the elections would go. When the opposition were formed, again, the leader of the opposition was Morgan Tsongirai, the ex-Secretary General of the Congress of Trade Unions. So ZANU-PF used the land, the colonialist baggage, the race issue to primarily disperse and disenfranchise the farm workers. And if you look at what happened around the whole land grab and the violence on the commercial farms in Zimbabwe, it was never ever a spontaneous land grab from the people of Zimbabwe. It was a government orchestrated, military driven, uh, 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 violent seizures of farms for individual politicians and the same thugs were used in every instance and every time it was targeting the farm workers. It was violence within the farm workers' villages. It was the farm workers that were beaten and raped and chased and therefore became disenfranchised from their areas because they were registered to vote in those constituencies and therefore completely destroyed a million votes. The white farmers were a mere consequence of an action. It was never ever anything to do about race or land or colonial imbalances. It was politics and destroying a vote that had a complete deciding factor on a sway vote uh, in the elections and around the, the opposition. So yes, whilst that's been portrayed and they've tried to create that perception, if anything, Robert Mugabe has brought the people of Zimbabwe, the African people of Zimbabwe, and I say, when I say African people, those are white people, those are Indian people, those are colored people, those are whoever's born and bred and native to Zimbabwean together. They have together shared immense difficulty and immense suffering under a repressive government. And if I would say, looking at issues of race, issues of colonialism, issues of any of the isms in Africa, Zimbabwe today is way ahead of any country because never again can those issues ever be brought up again. They've been dealt with uh, at, at, in the most violent manner. They've been dealt with in the most inhumane manner uh, and people have suffered together across the length and breadth of the country. So I can confidently say to you there is absolutely at the grassroots level and across the length and breadth of the people of the country, not a racial bone in their bodies. Thank you very much. Let me now uh, um, switch to uh, uh, outside of Zimbabwe. A lot of uh, us Africans were a little bit uh, surprised at the lukewarm attitude of the South African government over the years towards uh, Mugabe. I remember even the Kenyan Prime Minister uh, Odinga said Mugabe must go. And the Kenyans and other, other Africans were ready to get um, Mugabe out, but the South Africans going back to Mbeki and so on were very lukewarm. How can you explain that, that uh, uh, attitude of South Africa, which we believe has the key to the resolution of the Zimbabwean problem? Again, it goes back to the nationalist politics. It goes back to the liberation movements. It goes back to the countries in the SADC region, which originally termed the frontline states, who fought liberation wars to liberate those countries together. And when the threat came upon uh, ZANU-PF and Mugabe in Zimbabwe, Mugabe having been the first real liberator before Mandela was uh, released from prison, he was the total icon and uh, uh, he was revered in, in the circles of, of Southern Africa and was a leader in, in, in all the liberation of the countries around. So when after 20 years of his misrule, and South Africa is facing the same problems right now, he had failed to deliver on the issues and the values of what people went to liberation war for, and that people were still living in abstract poverty, nothing had moved forward for them, and they mobilized and organized and formed the Movement for Democratic Change, which was read by the unions, sent a very strong message to South Africa. The ANC is made up of a tripartite movement. You have the uh, South African Congress of Trade Unions, you have the South African Communist Party, and you have the ANC. And should 
a change happen in Zimbabwe whereby a liberation movement is replaced by a non-liberation uh, movement and democracy prevails where the people have a say in their future, it immediately sets a precedent and poses a threat on other uh, uh, liberating governments in the SADC region which are oppressive to their people, which haven't delivered in, uh, in alleviating poverty or bringing about change and therefore uh, find it very difficult to support that change. Okay, very interesting perspective. Very interesting. Uh, let me ask you one, one more question about um, uh, uh, um, the, the former Ethiopian uh, uh, communist dictator Mengistu Haile Mariam is in Zimbabwe, to the best of my knowledge, he lived there. And recently, uh, in North Africa, when uh, Muammar Gaddafi went on the run from his own people, we heard a lot of media talk that Gaddafi is going to go to Zimbabwe. He's going to join his friend Mugabe. I wonder what, what you people in, Mugabe, in South Africa, what did you think about that, that Zimbabwe becoming the, 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 the safe haven for, for dictators? Well, again, Leo, it's, it's very, very obvious of, of the fact that all these dictators have a club where they stick together and support each other. Um, obviously, the people of Zimbabwe are fighting their own battle to remove a, a dictator and a repressive government that is under a military junta. So they would absolutely not be happy at all if someone like Gaddafi ended up in Zimbabwe. But at the end of the day, it shows very clearly in the type of person you're dealing with in Robert Mugabe and the type of rule that's there that people like Mengistu who have either been offered sanctuary there that have huge blood on their hands, that are wanted in their own countries and there's warrants of arrest for them for massive uh, human rights abuse and murders, shows you exactly what the pop population of Zimbabwe have to deal with in trying to bring democracy and fight the dictatorship that's there. Uh, Robert Mugabe is, is in his 80s, that's correct. Is yeah, that I understand correct? he's 87. Yeah. He's 87. He's not going to leave forever. Can you uh, um, hazard some kind of a prediction what is going to happen in the next uh, maybe four, five, ten years in Zimbabwe when Mugabe is no longer there? It is very strongly uh, spoken about and very strongly believed in many circles that Robert Mugabe is terminally ill and has uh, prostate cancer that has gone into his liver and is receiving uh, hormone treatment on a regular basis to keep him going. That knowledge was uh, conveyed with inside Zanu PF and immediately that was known, a huge succession fight started with inside Zanu PF. We see recently one of the powerful ex-army commanders and ex-guerrilla commanders from the Liberation War uh, mysteriously burned to death in his home, which everybody believes was a murder. We see massive jostling and infighting with inside uh, uh, that government at the moment. We see the ministries in which they're involved in, involved in massive looting of national resources and positioning of, 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 um, of, of, of taking over businesses uh, for themselves um, and you know it's it's a very strong indication uh, of the implosion of ZANU-PF. The only legitimacy that has kept ZANU-PF going and if we go back in our history and take it right back to 1980 when uh, our first election took place and Bishop Abel Muzarewa was voted in, Mugabe refused to accept uh, that uh, election and uh, a second election was held. All the liberation fighters who'd been in the rural areas were supposed to come to assembly points and be out of the way so that they couldn't influence or, or um, intimidate anybody into voting. But starting from 1980 to every single election thereon, Robert Mugabe and Zona PF have realized that the way to win an election is imply um, uh, violence and intimidation, which uh, helps you win elections, and by winning elections, you can then get legitimacy. And have managed to carry that off right up until now. Some of the most violent elections, many that were rigged, that they lost uh, hugely. I mean, you know, it's not even a case of the MDC winning the 2008 elections. It took five weeks for those results to be announced. In that five weeks, so great was the vote against Sonu PF and Mugabe that even in five weeks, 
They could not rig a defeat, and the MDC still came out victorious in, in, in that election. So, again, uh, huge violence was employed. Uh, Mugabe announced a runoff, and uh, suddenly won an election and was uh, uh, sworn back in as, as the president. What carries it forward is, as I said to you before, it's the history. It's the history of Mugabe, revered as an icon of the Western world, having uh, been very instrumental in bringing about independence to, uh, to Zimbabwe in 1980, of them positioning and putting Robert Mugabe in place, of the rest of Africa supporting him, of him being a leading liberator. Uh, he would carry off that legitimacy. Once he's out the way, there's absolutely nobody left in ZANU-PF that would be able to carry off that legitimacy. And hence, the jostling and, and, and the power plays at play at the moment and threats of a, of, a, of, a, of a military coup should an election be lost. So we're heading into very, very precarious times in Zimbabwe. I think we're heading into some more severe violence as we go along. But again, all these issues are a process. The people of Zimbabwe have remained resolute. No one ever thought we'd be half of a, of a government. We are. And uh, people are still focused, and as I said to you, Tinoz Chengeta Moyo, every election come out and vote for change. Okay, very good, very good. My last question, John. Yes, the, the macroeconomic situation you just mentioned recently, the Zimbabwe dollar has essentially collapsed, is that correct? Absolutely. Right, and, and so you are, uh, I understand you have a basket of currencies that keep uh, the macroeconomic situation. How does it work? How can a country work without a currency? Well, basically, if you look at after the 2008 elections, Zimbabwe was a totally failed state, totally failed state. The education system had collapsed. The health system had collapsed. We were having sort of 70,000 people a month dying of cat cholera. Um, it was total catastrophe. The military had taken to going to the streets and looting uh, stuff out of whatever was left in the shops. There was nothing in the shops. There was nothing available. There was no fuel. I, I witnessed it firsthand because on my return to Zimbabwe, I was arrested. And I spent 40 days in prison in, in the remand center in, in Mutari and witnessed it was like being in a what I, I've only ever seen in Nazi concentration camps of skeleton-like people who, are in, who haven't eaten for days um, and the most horrific circumstances. And if ever you want to see the state of a failed state, look in the prisons. Um, it, I was in there for 40 days. In that time, six people died. The government didn't have the, the transport to come and remove the bodies from the prison and take them out the prison. The stench of those bodies I can still smell today. And I can still see the people, uh, the skeletons walking around. HIV was prevalent. Uh, for the first thing, if you want HIV to go into full-blown AIDS, deny people uh, nutrition, deny them health, um, terrible. So it was actually the MDC that saved the day, and our finance minister, uh, Minister Beatty, who has come in and turned the macroeconomics around by introducing the US dollar. To say there's a basket of countries is, is, is not true. Um, the main currency is the US dollar. He introduced the US dollar because at that stage and because of the hyperinflation and because of the state of affairs in the country, everyone was trading on the black market with the US dollar. So the US dollar was the de facto currency anyway. Um, and it immediately the introduction of the US dollar as the currency in Zimbabwe reduced the inflation figures down to single digit figures and uh, brought foodstuffs back in the, in the, you know, in the, in the shops and gave people hope. I was in prison again at, when that happened. The first paycheck that the prison guards got, the first visitors that the prisoners ever had to bring them food from their relatives happened after that first paycheck where that US dollar got into the economy. So it, it's working very well. It certainly had huge impact on the stabilization of the macroeconomics. And um, it's, it's, it's run the foreign currency reserves is, has built up from I understand when the Minister of Finance had his first fiscus in, in March of, of, of 2009, there was a revenue of about $200,000. I think we've now up to somewhere around about $1.5 billion, which has just been generated from a zero basis. So under extremely, extremely circ difficult circumstances with absolutely no IMF loans or funds or, or anything, 
Zimbabwe has managed to regularize itself and, and try and keep going. So the US dollar has been a saving grace for Zimbabwe. Yeah, yeah. Um, let me just clarify a little bit what I meant by a basket of currencies. I mean that you have the dollar, you have the rand, yeah. you have the euro, and, uh, and uh, uh, any other currency is, uh, is uh, those three are basically the, the ones that are acceptable all over Zimbabwe, right? Any, any currency is acceptable there uh, if, if, it's, if it's hard currency, so it okay. can be pounds or whatever, but mainly the two currencies used are the US dollar and the South African rand. Thank you. Okay, yeah, thank you. And uh, Farai, let's go to you. I'm sure you have some perspectives as a Zimbabwean yourself uh, that, that would be different from those of us who, who have not lived in Zimbabwe. So please. Well, let's hope. <coughs> Again, I just wanted to say it's a pleasure to have uh, Mr. Bennett in Iowa. Um, you'll probably appreciate the rich agricultural history as a farmer. So um, um, most of my questions have to do with the way forward um, for Zimbabwe. And uh, but my first question, you discussed some of it when you talked about how um, when you went into the global political agreement, um, there were five aspects which you know both parties had to agree and then um, see uh, be um, uh, see progress in. But so my question is, do you think uh, that uh, the MDC should be looked at and sort of judged uh, based on its uh, performance in the GPA, even though you know there has been all these um, um, issues or tensions with, um, with you know, uh, meaningful cooperation with ZANU-PF. Do you think people should look at whatever has come out of the process and say and and evaluate, you know, the MDC's uh, competence as a um, as a political party? I think I think you have to because I think the MDC went into uh, into this uh, into this government um, and they sacrificed political capital for humanitarian uh, uh, reasons. Had the MDC not gone into this government politically, it, it, I should imagine, and I do believe, that it would all be over by now. There were many, there was a serious debates uh, in the party before they entered into that global political agreement and went into it, government sharing with, with ZANU-PF. But uh, the SADC region got involved uh, they were extremely concerned because a de facto military coup actually took place when the announcement of that election and when they saw how convincingly Zona Pierre and Robert Mugabe had been beaten. Um, at the same time, the total failed state was evident to the SADC region and had the MDC not gone into that government, there would have been massive human suffering and severe deterioration into the Zimbabwean situation, which would have created massive pressure on the surrounding countries of more humans fleeing Zimbabwe going into, into those countries, uh, as well as, as a lot of deaths within inside Zimbabwe. So the MDC went in understanding that, and Morgan Tsongi Rai, as, as the president of the party, sacrificed that human aspect to get people food, to stabilize the macroeconomics, to sort out the social agenda against the political uh, uh, capital, which has played, a, has played a huge price. So yes, you know, it's very, you have to because the MDC went into that government, but one needs to also understand that you can only inform, perform in a government where everybody's working together and playing off the same plate. Um, you have such a diverse, uh, and polarised situation there, that there's no ways, it's abs in fact, it's absolutely astounding that some of the MDC ministries have been able to deliver in any way whatsoever. So again, the people of Zimbabwe understand these things. The people of Zimbabwe are the ones that will vote in the next election. And, you know, they will, they will certainly evaluate the MDC's performance in that government and the MDC's having gone into that government, they'll evaluate it against their own lives and their own social circumstances and uh, you know, they'll vote how, however they want. So the MDC will reap the benefit from the electorate of having gone into that global political agreement. Okay, or, 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 the, or the loss from the, from the right, electorate. Right. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. um, and recently, uh, ZANU-PF and Mugabe have been behind uh, the indigenization program that you mentioned, where they are trying to um, uh, have at least 51% uh, of any foreign company be owned locally. Um, and um, I understand ZAN, um, MDC has 
differing viewpoints. ZANPF is saying it's an indigenization, it's affirmative action, whereas MDC has differing viewpoints. So I, I wanted you to expand on why um, uh, the MDC does not necessarily agree with the indigenization program and whether um, there are any, you can talk of any parallels between the indigenization program and um, your explanation of the um, lender distribution as far as um, the intentions of the, the program itself. Yeah, firstly, Farai, we are a social democratic party and one of our chief policies and agendas and objectives is broad-based economic empowerment. We are the first to encourage a broad-based economic empowerment of people. What is happening with ZANU-PF and the 51% in indigenization is a kleptocratic theft by ZANU-PF hierarchy and politicians enriching themselves, enriching the military, and enriching all the people in power through patronage to hold on to that power, which is exactly what happened with the whole land issue. Whilst the whole land issue was portrayed as a, 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 an imbalance and that landless people were being settled, who owns the farms today? Uh, the vast majority of the farms are in the hands of military brigadiers, majors, of judges, of, of Zonopiev ministers, um, and a lot of them lie derelict and totally unproductive. Yet, uh, when they were taken, those farms had crops on them, those farms had equipment, those farms were developed. And so for a short period, they financially benefited out of the looting and plunder of those farms and uh, have destroyed them. So in order to keep that patronage going and to keep those same people loyal to ZANU-PF and Mugabe, they moved on to the businesses. And you know, in all these things and when adversity strikes for I, it's very difficult because when the farmers were all getting hammered, business in town didn't have a lot to say. They sat back and watched uh, the terror, the total human rights abuses and destruction that was happening and basically got sucked into the issue that it was a land issue. They tried to get involved in uh, offering, uh, raising money and finance to buy land to offer government, which they totally skimmed over the whole political agenda. And it, now you find them facing exactly the same, the same threat. And it's that same threat of, of a political elite trying to loot and enrich themselves on the backdrop of an election whereby through patronage they can control the military and the security forces. Uh -huh. And then I understand, um, um, so it, it, it sounds like um, it's a mechanism for you know, building some kind of a war chest for the elections. Does the MDC have um, a sort of parallel mechanism for you know, preparing for the elections as far as um, um, fundraising, but also um, what are some of the um, mechanisms that the MDC you know, uh, hopes to implement to prevent that kind of a wholesale sort of plundering of resources for, you know, that are supposed to benefit the whole country but end up just being for an election? We've made it very clear and have always made it very, very public. As I said to you, we believe in a broad-based empowerment. We believe in social responsibility where communities and people of communities where those resources are need to benefit from those resources in a manner uh, that will sustain them and bring them the social uh, necessities that they need. Um, again, you know, if you look back in the history of Southern Africa, you look at the previous rev uh, repressive regimes uh, during the Rhodesian era and the Jews during the South African apartheid era. And part of my brief, my deployment to London, and part of what I'm doing here in the United States is to build up a global uh, 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 alliance, to build up a solidarity movement, to highlight these issues for us. And you touched on a very, very important issue. The MDC and the people of Zimbabwe, under extreme poverty and uh, a total failed state, do not have the resources to mobilize or challenge Robert Mugabe. Just the same as the people of Zimbabwe and the people of South Africa never had the resources to challenge the Rhodesian regime or the apartheid regime. A global solidarity was put in place under the anti-apartheid movement and uh, the world at large 
recognized that injustice, recognized the wrong that was being done there, contributed, raised money across the length and breadth. Western governments got involved. They've done it to a, a, a degree in Zimbabwe. You, you will hear from ZANU PF sanctions, sanctions, sanctions. It's got absolutely nothing to do with the MDC or anything. It's, it's, it's Western governments who've put targeted measures on people who've committed human rights abuses. And obviously, when they feel that those human rights abuses have been addressed, they will remove those restrictions. Heading into another election now, and already we see those human rights abuses right across the length and breadth of the country, it would be absolutely foolhardy to remove those restrictions. But those restrictions help on the pressure on oppressive regimes. But it's not enough. It's, it's small restrictions on, on a number of, say, 200 people. Uh, had there not been total blockout against the Rhodesian and South African regimes who were militarily powerful, had there not been the total support and raising the monies that were needed to fund the organizational uh, structural building of, of structures on the ground to face those regimes, those people would never have succeeded. So I am in the international community raising these issues, trying to raise those resources, trying to get that solidarity to send back home to our people to be able to structure, to be able to move around the country, to be able to communicate, and to be able to deal with their own issues. Uh, resources equal results. Uh, you look at the United States here, and uh, it's no different to anywhere in the world. The president that raises the biggest war chest wins the election. It's exactly the same in African politics. But the difference being is that the MDC has absolutely no base internally to raise a ZAC. It's poverty-stricken. Most people are eating one meal a day. They battle to travel from one place to the other. So we have a challenge on our hands. And uh, you know, I have a, a huge uh, a challenge uh, in representing my party and my people in trying to raise those resources. But I do believe that a black-on-black -black repression is no worse than a white-on-black repression. It's the same thing. It's repression. If anything, uh, what Mugabe has done to Zimbabwe and the people of Zimbabwe is ten times worse than what Ian Smith ever did in the Rhodesian era. Uh, I do believe that once people understand these issues and see the truth of it, we will be able to mobilize and be able to take care of, of an election and change in Zimbabwe. Uh, my next question um, has to do with uh, the youth um, and how, because you also talked about uh, farm workers and how I would say um, uh, they are some of the um, the, the populations that have become marginalized in Zimbabwe based on um, the, um, the just the economic underperformance, but people like uh, farm workers, uh, the youth who you know come out of school without any employment prospects, do you think um, the MDC can uh, be able to guarantee their activism um, or involvement in politics? Um, would the MDC you know endorse um, and say? You guys should go out and um, you know be activists and fight for this cause, uh, even despite the fact that you know there isn't a an exact um, like a guarantee on their welfare or that there's not going to be harm happening to them. Absolutely right, Farai. Again, it gets back to resources. The youth know what they want. The displaced farm workers, who, if anyone ever should have had a title to land or should have had. Um, a chance at land was them. Uh, they were skilled, they knew how to work the land, they were totally marginalized because of their, uh, their political affiliation. So yes, the youth has a huge role to play. But let's look at the Arab Spring to north of Africa. Let's look at what happened in Egypt. Let's look what's just happened in Libya. Had those people not had the resources to organize, not had the resources to structure, not had the resources to communicate and mobilize amongst themselves, there would never have been an Arab Spring. And it's taken many years of repression for those people to finally get where they've got. But rest assured, I can tell you that millions of dollars went into those countries to assist those people to be able to mobilize and structure themselves in the manner that they did. And when that happens in Zimbabwe, you will see in a very short time the same youth that you're talking about who hold it dear and hold their country dear to their hearts but have just never had the mechanism or the tools
to be able to mobilize and structure and act. It needs resources for her. It needs resources. It needs communication for social networking. It needs airtime. It needs money. And when people are destitute, how do they organize? Last question. Um, I mean, I guess I have never voted in my whole life because um, I left Zimbabwe when I was 18. Do you think uh, in the next election, you know, um, the MDC will be able to uh, guarantee that you know people in the diaspora can be able to uh, vote, but also to make you know campaign contributions? Um, given because I think in Zimbabwe political parties cannot um, cannot be funded by external or f foreign sources, but do you think um, those can happen in the next election? I think they definitely can. For you know, I've I've had the absolute pleasure, and it's given me huge hope and perspective. I've met um, Chris and Justin, who are my colleagues. Uh, they are in the external assembly of the Movement for Democratic Change. Um, they have made contacts here. They've done huge work here in, in dealing with people, getting the message across. Um, and it's a case of mobilizing, structuring us Zimbabweans, wherever we are, uh, to push for what we want. And for the external vote, you know, there's no guarantees on anything. All you can do is push for it um, and, and see if it comes about. But even if the external vote doesn't come about, there's enough of, of Zimbabweans in uh, the diaspora to mobilize resources to get home to, to fight this thing. And, and you know, in all these things, uh, 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 Farai, yes, there's a political party's financing act, there's repressive laws or whatever. But when people want to change things and people want to do something, they're going to do it. Nothing is going to stop them. So I have huge hope, and as I said to you, what keeps me going amongst all, you know, these days when I do get very despondent, these days when I'm, like I'm now separated from my wife, my wife and I have a suitcase each, we live in a flat in London, our home in Harare is there uh, with all our stuff, I don't know when I'll be going back to it, I don't know what tomorrow holds, I'm here today in Iowa, uh, tomorrow back, uh, back at Drake University, I'm in South Africa the next weekend, I don't know what tomorrow holds, but what I do know is what the people in Zimbabwe want. And the people that elected me and put me where I am, what they want. They want a better life. They want a job. They want democracy. They want good governance. And all I say is uh, united together, winning for a new Zimbabwe. So let's say thank you to uh, Roy Bennett and to Farai Marazi and Leo Echo. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Unfortunately, our hour has come to an end, but I would like to thank all of you who came here to hear World Canvas uh, Studio today. Our partners are UITV, the UI Pentecrest Museums, KRUI, and Information Technology Services, and you will be able to see this program on cable television channels around the state. Also hear it on Iowa Public Radio, and you can find this broadcast on iTunes as well as a podcast. So uh, more information can be found at our website, international.uiowa.edu. Many thanks to my colleagues in international programs and also UITV. That's it for this edition of World Canvas Studio with Roy Bennett. Thank you so much. I'm Joan Kerr, and see you next time. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.